Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations upon all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have to say one of my favorite movies must be the 1993 comedy Groundhog Day. Anybody know, remember that, that movie? In that movie, Bill Murray plays Phil Connors, a self-absorbed weatherman. And it's Groundhog Day. And Phil Connors is in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for the festival in which Phil the Groundhog checks to see if he sees his shadow. Bill Murray's character then awakes to discover that he must live the same day over and over and over and over again. After his initial shock, he discovers some freedom in a life without tomorrow. Unfortunately, he uses his freedom in a manner that's true to his nature. He's despicable, he's selfish, he takes advantage of others, he lives a life of dissipation, of emptiness without meaning. Phil Connors begins to reap the results of that kind of life. He becomes depressed, he acts irrationally, he lashes out at others, he tries multiple times to commit suicide, but every day he awakes to relive the same Groundhog Day. After he hits rock bottom, the abyss of his own making, Phil Connors begins to change. He begins to use his time in more productive ways. He learns French, he learns to how to sculpt ice, he studies literature and philosophy, he takes piano lessons. But more than this, his transformation becomes tied to the people of Puxatani themselves. By spending time with them, he learns their stories, their joys, and their challenges, and he learns to love these quirky, idiosyncratic people. At the same time each day, Phil helps an older couple repair a tire that goes out. He counsels a young newlywed couple. He cares for a homeless man near death. In short, he begins to redeem the time. According to some estimates, the time that Phil Connor spends reliving Groundhog Day is just short of 34 years. Now, you have to have a lot of time on your hands to actually sit down and try to calculate all that out. Now, obviously, none of us have had that kind of experience. However, I think we can sympathize with Phil Connors. Sometimes it appears as if we're doomed to repeat the same terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. This morning, in our scripture reading, the Apostle Paul tells us that the days are actually evil. Nonetheless, we're told to make the most of the time. Now, in a world as time conscious as ours, one might imagine Paul is promoting the use of planning calendars, Google reminders, or the seven habits of highly effective people. No, Paul isn't telling us to use better time management techniques. The Greeks had two words for time. The one, the one associated with clocks and calendars was known as chronos. The other was kairos. This is the sort of time that was associated with something a bit deeper. You remember when Thomas Paine wrote, these are the times which try men's souls? That's kairos. Those times are kairos times. In a sense, chronos is quantitative and kairos is qualitative. For example, December 25th, is the chronos of Christmas. On the other hand, the kairos of Christmas is gathering together, lighting candles, celebrating the birth of Jesus. In the scriptures, we encounter kairos in verses like Mark 1, 15. Jesus says, the time, the kairos, is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. The kairos, that moment in time that's pregnant with possibilities, the time is at hand, it's here. And that's exactly when Paul talks about this time, about the days of evil, make the most of the time, he's talking about kairos, this moment. There are times of opportunity or crisis, the defining moments of our lives, take advantage of them, Make the most of them. 
When Paul talks about making the most of our kairos, he's encouraging Christians to seize opportunities that God has given. We should live our lives to God's glory. Now, actually, I don't really like this translation of, that we, we read, read this morning about making the most of. I actually prefer the King James Version, which translates a verse, redeem the time. There's something actually that captures the meaning of the word. The word redeem was a word of commerce. The Greek literally means buy up at the marketplace. Get them while they're hot. Go for the gusto. Life is short. Play hard. Carpe diem. Seize the day. That's what Paul's saying. Now, these are words that you would probably associate with party years at Mardi Gras, not those living the Christian life. Christianity is not about revelry. It's serious business. It's all about self-denial. Maybe that's part of our problem. Have we forgotten the excitement, the passion, and the joy of the Christian life? Sure, the days are evil, but redeem the time. Take advantage. Make the most. Now, this morning, we, we started this whole service with a question from the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief end of man? And the answer? Boy, you guys are still waking up. What's the chief end of, what is our chief end? Yes, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, right? Now, we Presbyterians haven't always lived that out. I think we probably do a pretty good job on the glorifying God part. We acknowledge God's greatness, and when we speak about God, we often use hushed, reverent tones. But what about enjoying God? Glorifying God and enjoying God forever. Now, as Christians, we follow the way of the cross, and the days are evil, suffering is real, others will step on us and take advantage of us, we're going to be poured out, emptied, but our cup continues to overflow. We're not masochists. We believe that after Good Friday that Easter will come. Heaven is depicted as, in Scripture as a banquet, a feast, a big party. We should take pleasure in God and in our lives. When the pastor and preacher John Piper discovered the joy of our life in Christ, he wrote, as I look back on it now, it seems so patently obvious that I don't know how I could have missed it. All those years I've been trying to suppress my tremendous longing for happiness so I could honestly praise God out of some higher, less selfish motive. But now it started to dawn on me that this persistent and undeniable yearning for happiness was not to be suppressed, but to be glutted on God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Live out the ecstasy of our life in Jesus Christ. Do you remember what happened at Pentecost? People there that were sitting on the periphery were observing what's happening, and some of them turned to each other and said, those guys must be drunk. You remember what Peter's response was? It's nine in the morning. We wouldn't be drunk yet. They were filled with the joy and excitement of the reality of God. The risen Christ was now Lord of their lives. Through the Holy Spirit, their teacher, their savior, their Lord would remain with them always. When is the last time that we were mistook for people who would be in drunk? When have people looked at our lives in Christ and the, at the excitement, the revelry, the, the joy that we have and said, man, there's something wrong with those people? When does that happen last? In fact, Paul makes the exact same comparison here. He wants to, to compare, says, don't get drunk on wine. Instead, worship. Instead, live out this joy. Paul warns us not to confuse the ecstasy in our lives in Christ with the cheap imitation. Fakes leave people empty. Just ask the alcoholic lying in a hospital room waiting for the liver transplant that will never come because he can't stay off the booze. 
Ask the young woman who desires a relationship and intimacy and all she gets is sex. Ask the church with programs and budgets but is spiritually dead. Instead of despair, we could live lives of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Instead of being empty, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, we're not talking about some sort of psychic energy or self-actualization or sitting over in the corner with having warm fuzzies with Jesus. It's not about that. Just as Phil Connors found redemption in the lives of the people of Punxsutawney, living a life in the Holy Spirit means living together in service. Service to each other and service to God. Our first scripture this morning points to that sense of what is the greatest commandment, Jesus? What is it? Well, it's to love God with your whole heart, your mind, and your soul. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our connection to God and our connection to each other, this is the way we redeem the time. Our service to God, our service to each other is the way in which we can actually experience this joy. Notice how even our worship connects us to the other, others in the community of faith. We usually think of, of, of worship and being in isolation. You come here on, on Sunday morning and you sit in your pew and we often don't make contact with other folks. I mean, we may before the service, we may right after the service, but actually in, in the midst of the service itself, it's almost like we're in a bubble, disconnected to everybody else. But that's not what worship is supposed to be. Worship is about our connection to God and to each other. We worship together, precisely we're in the same room, not because it's easier. I mean, we could all sit at home and watch a live video stream of this. Instead, we gather together in order to address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're to give thanks for everything in the name of Christ, to submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. The prayers, the music, the words, the actions of worship shape our ecstasies, forming and molding us into the people of God. We come to do this together. We realize and recall the stories that we share one another and we recognize and realize that our joy, our hope comes from what Christ has given us. We might be singing a song and it means nothing to us, but we do it anyway because it means something to someone else. I remember actually when Sarah was serving a church in, in Indiana, in southern Indiana, they had an opportunity, they had, they had the, a very traditional style of worship and they were trying to introduce different styles. And one thing that they had was every once in a while they'd have a youth Sunday where the youth would pick the music and pick the verses and be part of the whole service. And on the preparation for that, Sarah went to the youth and said, hey, so let's plan this together. What, what sort of music would you like? What sort of, what sort of you know, what, what's, what do you wanna have for this service? And she expected and assumed that they were going to say some of the new possibilities, the new, maybe a praise chorus here or there, or something like that. Instead, they said, let's sing How Great Thou Art. Really? How Great Thou Art? Yeah, because that's Mrs. Smith's favorite hymn. Oh, oh, and we should sing Amazing Grace as well because Mr. Smith, that was so meaningful to him when we sang that at his wife's funeral. Oh, and, and we should sing such and such because that's so-and-so's favorite hymn as well. That attitude that those young people had is exactly the attitude all of us should have. The sense of submitting to one another. Now, it doesn't work if it all goes one way. But if we are together, each one of us, sort of thinking about the other, submitting to the other, and, and recognizing, realizing, trying to, to do our best for the other, there's something really beautiful about that. And our worship can honor God, but also can lift up the body. It happens that way. 
Someone once asked me, he says, won't it get boring in heaven praising God all the time? I mean, maybe it's gonna become like some monotonous Groundhog Day, awaking each day to sing the same old songs. I don't think so. I mean, we could go on for days praising the qualities of our favorite movies, our songs, and our books. There's a whole media that's been built on that. You go to YouTube, look up your favorite movie, and you'll see a thousand different interpretations and, and praise for that favorite movie of yours. Now, we also like, for example, we share, we're willing to share what our children and our grandchildren are doing. We'll tell anybody, right? Let me show you a picture, too. I've got a, a dozen I'll be happy to, to run by you. Why? Because we have so much joy. We have so much joy in our children and in those things that make, give us pleasure. Now imagine for a minute how awesome God is. Imagine for a moment what Christ has done for us. He died for us, he rose again for us. He gave us this opportunity of a life eternal with him. Heaven will be many things, but it certainly won't be monotonous. Be passionate, church. Be filled with joy. Redeem the time. Enjoy God forever. Amen.